Can you hear me? Yes, I said here. Mrs. Gensimer? Here. Mr. Kravchek? Here. Mr. Moore? Here. Mr. Parzik? Here. Mrs. Rich? Here. The meeting is now open. Adequate notice of the meeting was provided by posting a copy of the time and place on the municipal clerk's bulletin board and mailing a copy of same to the press and the Cape May County Herald on April 16th, 2020. For the record, this work session is being held via video telephone conference in a Zoom format. Will everyone please rise to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag. United States of America. United States of America. To the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation under God, indivisible. Okay, we'll start the work session with public safety. Council Member Dallahan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to ask. Um, our administrator, Bob Smith, he wanted to uh, start off this session with uh, some comments on port consolidation. Bob? Thank you, Councilman. Um, back in the spring, I was asked to give a presentation to Council about general consolidation matters throughout the state of New Jersey, the state of legislation or legislative initiatives. And it primarily had to do with uh, schools. But during my research, I had the opportunity to really dive into the joint legislative initiative uh, called, commonly called Path to Progress. Um, and that's a bipartisan initiative at the state level uh, in the Senate primarily, but also with bills in the New Jersey General Assembly. And within that legislation uh, or within that proposal, there's various legislation and I came across a study that was conducted uh, by the New Jersey Supreme Court. And for all intents and purposes, that study had indicated that the future of New Jersey municipal courts was one where, would we, where, we, we, where we would see uh, consolidation. And so I began the process of taking a look at that. And truthfully, at that time, the stars were aligning in that our court administrator, Debbie, had put us on notice that she was retiring at the end of the year. And shortly thereafter, uh, our deputy had resigned. And so I thought that put us in a very good position uh, to look at, to examine uh, issues of consolidation with neighboring municipalities. Um, I had the opportunity, of course, I, I went first to the chief of police as, uh, you know, somebody that would be affected. Of course, I spoke to Debbie, and then I had the opportunity to speak with the administrator in Avalon, Scott Wall. And they had also expressed an interest in uh, doing a joint court or probably more likely a consolidated court with Stone Harbor and Avalon into the future. And uh, from my point of view, it provides a lot of advantages. First and foremost, is that preliminarily, if we do this, and if it makes sense to the governing body of Stone Harbor, we're able to save about $95,000 a year. Also, uh, when I did speak to the chief, he felt, uh, as I did, that there was really no advantage to being responsible for the security and having the traffic inside of our municipal building and inside the court on a weekly basis. And that overall, there would be minimal impact on the residents and the visitors of the borough of Stone Harbor, because truthfully, if somebody has to go to court, um, it's not that much more difficult to go to Avalon than what it is to go to Stone Harbor Municipal Court. And so uh, had the opportunity to share this information with the Committee of Public Safety on Public Safety. And I think almost universally, everybody agrees that it's, it's something that we should take a real hard look at. We can save money, we can make the quality of life here in Stone Harbor better. And basically we're gonna be ahead of the curve 
when it comes to state mandate in the future. The New Jersey Supreme Court Study Commission has said municipal courts will consolidate. Everything else in the state of New Jersey, it appears as if it's precatory and suggestive, but municipal courts uh, will be consolidated. So my thought was, let's get a head start. Good, thanks, Bob. Um, I'd now like to call uh, the aforementioned Debbie Scott to give her uh, report, please. Debbie, are you with us? Yeah, I was unmuting. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I didn't when you hear phones ringing and whatnot in my house. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it has been a crazy summer so far. I am swamped. Um, takes a while to get all the tickets into the computer system, especially with everything that has is being written at this point. So if anybody complains to you about tickets not being in, it's because it's taking me a while to get them into the system. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Well, I had a, some funny come up on my screen. That's why I was like, I didn't know if everybody was there or not. Uh, if anybody has it, with the consolidation, the council does have to decide which route they want to go as in joint or consolidated, and agreements have to be drafted and approved by the AOC. I know time's running short. Five months and counting. Debbie, how long does that take? That's, it depends on who's asked to review everything. I have to send it to my vicinage. Judge Mendez has to review it. <clears throat> Depending on what his schedule is like, I honestly can't tell you how long. Judge Birchmeyer has told me before that it's taken a while. Other places it goes quick. So I honestly can't answer that one. Thank you. I, I can't answer that either, but I think, I, I think we would be more along the lines of shared service as opposed to a joint court. Um, and that's probably a little bit more expedited with the same savings and same benefits as a joint court, but that's something uh, that once, you know, the entire governing body here is aware of and generally supportive of the attorneys from uh, Stone Harbor and, and Avalon will begin that process. And Scott and I have gotten a jump start on it, but uh, at this point, if the governing body feels comfortable, we would move forward officially. So, Bob, what sort of formal action do we have to take? Would it be in the form of a resolution, as a motion? What do we have to do to get it started? Um, I, I just think from tonight, I, I think just, you know, a, a motion administrator proceed. Uh, officially, the position of the governing body of Stone Harbor is that it's desirable and we want to pursue it. And Scott and I have been talking and, and we for all intents and purposes, we do have an agreement uh, that we would recommend to our respective governing bodies. And then uh, Mr. Caravan and the solicitor for Avalon would basically prepare uh, a shared service agreement. And there'd I'm not an sure of the formality. An prepared and then it'll be submitted to the court for approval to the administrative offices for a joint court. And it's done in the form of mutual ordinances. Okay. So do we have to do something tonight or could this just come forward in two weeks after everybody's got an opportunity to look at the agreement that's in place and the attorneys look at it? Um, is that what we would do? I think Bob's right. All you need to do is direct him by motion to proceed. Okay. And then we would do some something more formal and uh, council would have an opportunity to review any kind of agreements and so on and so forth and see the particulars and it would actually be voted on in two weeks. 
Can we move uh, that quickly? Um, I, I don't know if it can move that quickly, but if you give me direction, Mr. Administrator, proceed. Uh, Scott and I will be able to come up with an agreement and then we'll go to our respective attorneys and say, this is what we have in mind. Can you please uh, review it? make any recommended changes and let's begin the process of drafting an ordinance for introduction uh, and then proceed as we normally would under that that process. Okay. So this process is going to take an ordinance. That's what Mark said, yes. Okay. Okay. So I believe that the administrative office of the courts, the municipal division within this vicinage uh, will proceed uh, I don't want to say quickly, but I, I think that they'll be happy to see this type of movement because it is strongly um, being recommended or it's going to be directed by the Supreme Court after their study. Okay, well, we'll put a motion on in the regular meeting and then um, you can get started on the, the agreement and we can introduce the ordinance then in two weeks. Very good. Okay. Okay. Debbie, do you have anything else? No, I don't. Okay. Let's go then to um, Chief Stanford of the fire department and get the fire department report, which has been a very busy month. Good afternoon, all. Uh, I have a report for July. And as uh, Mr. Dallahan said, we've had a very busy, uh, busy uh, July and August. But uh, for July, we had 64 fire calls. Uh, that is above what we had at the same time last year. Uh, we have 100 EMS calls, and that's uh, around the same that we had at the same time last year. Uh, the calls included uh, four cooking fires, two grass fires, one trash fire, seven medical assists, five beach EMS assists, one motor vehicle accident, one search for a person in the water, two elevator rescues, one surf rescue, five watercraft rescues, four natural gas leaks, three arcing wires, 24 fire alarms, and three carbon monoxide alarms. Uh, so that is my report. Thank you, Chief. Um, any questions, comments from anyone? Okay, we'll move along to um, Chief Shutta to get the uh, fire, uh, I'm sorry, the police department report. Chief. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'd like to begin by thanking Mayor, Count, Mayor Council and the Borough Administrator uh, for the commitment and swearing in our two newest officers later on today. Uh, your collective support to fill these two vacancies is much needed and will return us to full staffing by June of next year. Uh, and we greatly, as always, appreciate all that you continue to do for us at the Police Department. Uh, on the topic of personnel, all of our staff has remained healthy in the midst of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And of course, we continue to, to take the necessary precautions to remain as healthy as possible. Uh, as of today, many of our summer personnel will remain working uh, with us until mid to late September. Uh, in the past, sometimes they leave early to mid August. And thankfully this year, we have them uh, for a, a, a few more weeks. Uh, during the month of July, four adults were arrested and there were 24 motor vehicle stops. Uh, we've definitely seen an increase just from July into August, much like the fire department has seen. And of course, the, those numbers will be reported next month. Uh, as the summer begins to wind down, we've already started to make plans for the hiring of class one and class two officers for next year. And thankfully, many of our current class ones and twos have already indicated the desire to return to work for us for the summer of 2021. Uh, that's all I have. Uh, and thank you again to everyone for all their support. Thank you. Any questions from anyone else? Chief, I'd just like to um, acknowledge the uh, letter of commendation that you received from a um, resident of Stone Harbor for your work in um, helping the individual's father who had a uh, difficulty. So um, moving along to uh, the beach patrol, uh, Captain Sandy Basako, are you available, Sandy? I'm here. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, we also have experienced a, uh, a very active month. Um, in the past month, we had 13 rescues, six EMS calls, one police call, five lost children were found, uh, two kayakers were rescued, 
Uh, one distressed wave runner was rescued and three surfers were rescued off of the pipe on the 111th Street Beach. Uh, we are fully staffed. Uh, our beaches have been and continue to be more crowded than they were this time last year. Um, and I think we will likely experience a similar situation after Labor Day. Um, we hope to have enough guards available because of the impact of COVID on schools going online um, and the changing of their scheduling and sports being canceled. So, but it's still up in the air. A lot of the guards really don't know <clears throat> what their situation will be in a few weeks. Um, and that's my report. Thank you, Sandy. Um, JT Locos, are you um, sure. on? Frank, Frank Sorry? before we go on, I just wanted to take this uh, opportunity to thank Sandy and the Beach Patrol for supporting that wedding of the sea ceremony that was held on Saturday. Uh, that was a wild and wooly ride. You took the pastor on, uh, but you pulled it off with no casualties. And of course, thanks as well to uh, Police Department Public Works for helping them out. So thanks. Good job. Thank you. Very good. Thank, thank you, Ray. Uh, JT, are you going to give your report now or do you want to do it later? I, I'd prefer to do it now if I could. I'm kind of restricted on time. Um, you're on, if that's you're on okay. Then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, so for this month on July uh, 30th, I attended the um, County OEM coordinators meeting. Um, several issues uh, were discussed. The, the, the most important was that the uh, EOP is currently being worked on by me. Uh, it has to be updated every um, few years. And I will be submitting that. Uh, it has to be submitted by December 31st to County OEM. And I don't foresee any problems um, getting that done. Most of the information is current. It just needs to be um, updated in a, a few certain places. So I, I may be reaching out to Department heads, um, if I do get that information to you, if you could return it to me in a timely fashion, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, on August 4th, as you all know, uh, Tropical Storm Isaias um, greatly affected the borough. Uh, we did have, uh, as I'm sure you all noticed, several borough-owned trees were damaged. Um, several borough structures um, did receive some minor damage in the form of um, roof and uh, shingle loss and things of that nature. Um, most notably the firehouse in the lifeguard shack. Um, I was asked uh, by County OEM to provide a preliminary damage assessment, uh, which um, was conducted by me with the input from the department heads. Overall, we fared very, very well. Um, we had two residential structures that were damaged. Um, one of the structures damage was actually damaged by another structure um, with debris flying off of the roof. Um, otherwise, we did fare very well, and I, I want to give a, a big thumbs up to Public Works, whose response, I mean, the town was cleaned up almost if nothing had happened within hours of the storm passing, so um, just job well done. Um, as you all know, this is the second tropical storm to affect us so far this summer, which is um, pretty unusual. Uh, as predicted, the tropics are very, very active, and we have two potential systems right now. Uh, that we'll probably see development in the next few days. So uh, I will be monitoring that closely. Um, finally, as far as COVID goes, um, we are currently less than 100 active cases in the county. Uh, we are definitely seeing a decline uh, in the number of cases. And there are currently three cases at long-term care facilities. So um, things are definitely improving there greatly. And that 100 does include the out of county and in county mm -hmm. um, residents. And that's my report. Thank you, JT. Any questions for JT? Okay, I'll turn it over to um, Jennifer Gensimer. Good afternoon. Uh, our Recreation and Tourism Committee uh, continues to adapt to the ever-changing environment uh, we're presented with with the challenges of uh, COVID-19. And uh, first, we would like to uh, have a report by our Recreation Department um, Director, and that is Tina Prickett. And Tina, you're doing a tremendous job pivoting and meeting the needs of um, all of our citizens who enjoy your Recreation Department. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. 
Um, so our sports clinics uh, wrapped up this Thursday. Uh, it was definitely a bittersweet ending. I know a lot of the kids that are looking to extend their time down the shore were hoping that we could extend the, the clinics and camps, but um, due to my staff leaving, we weren't able to accommodate that. However, we were able to extend our arts and crafts for a week. Um, so I still have my staff staying for that, and we were able to extend our arts and crafts programming uh, to the end of this week, which was great. A lot of the, the parents and uh, the kids are really happy about that. Um, despite the difficult times that we faced, um, we've actually exceeded our revenue from last summer for our sports clinics, um, which is amazing. Uh, pickleball and tennis continue to be really, really popular around the community with our courts continuously packed. Uh, there has been some talk about to see if we can extend our pickleball programming into the shoulder months, probably between uh, Labor Day weekend to Columbus Day weekend, but we'll, we'll discuss that at a later point to see if, you know, if the need is still there. Um, most of my staff actually did return back to college, uh, so I am now relying on a lot of the local kids to work the office, the shift hours and stuff for the courts. Um, we do have actually a handful of programming still going on. Uh, our boot camp continues. Um, yoga on the beach continues. Our surf camp continues straight on through till September 9th. Uh, power yoga, and we also still have our Crafty Chef cooking camp. Uh, moving forward, we are looking to extend some of our programming through September. I know that a lot of uh, a lot of our community is sticking around as they're doing virtual learning and working from home. So we're going to try to accommodate that as best as we can. And that's my report. Thank you very much, Tina. You're doing an excellent job in, in very challenging circumstances. Uh, next, we have our Tourism and Public Information Director, Jenny Olson. And uh, Jenny uh, is constantly put to the test of pivoting and communicating uh, all the changes that are constantly occurring. Jenny, do you have your report? I, I do. Um, I have a, a of number of things. Um, over the weekend, we had St. Brendan's Wedding of the Sea Ceremony that was held on Saturday um, at the 80th Street Athletic Field. Um, just wanted to let everyone know it, that it did go very smoothly. I know some of you were there. Um, the staff from the church um, did a really good job of keeping people at a safe distance and keeping the entire event um, very orderly. They even gave out their own uh, commemorative masks. Uh, we estimated that there were just over 600 people in attendance. And just to clarify, there's no limit on the crowd size when you're having a religious event, if anyone was uh, interested in that. I'm currently working um, on another video PSA. Uh, this one is to promote signups for the borough's code red system. Um, these are the emergency notifications you can receive um, directly to your cell phone during an emergency and by email. Um, I'm working with Roger Sanford, JT Lacoste, and Bob Smith. Uh, we're working with the same videographer that we used for our previous PSA. Uh, should, be, should be ready in a day or two. We just needed to re-record uh, some narration on that, make some final edits. Um, and then, um, at the regular meeting, there's a resolution to extend the farmer's market through the end of September. And I did informally poll all of our vendors and over half of them are uh, interested in continuing. The request um, is to extend it through the end of September for now. And just to confirm, the vendors do have to submit proof of insurance to continue to participate. Uh, the last item I have, and this is something that you know, if, if you want to, you know, if you want to jump in and ask some questions, this is something that um, the Chamber of Commerce asked me to bring up. Um, the administrator for the Chamber of Commerce, Marnie Lengel, um, wanted me to share some details of an event that they'd like to have. This is September 25th and 26th. Um, pr prior to submitting their event application, they wanted to share some ideas so that Council, Public Works, or Police and Fire have any concerns or suggestions they could incorporate that into their plans before they submit so nothing is left out. Um, since they can't have the annual Saver September Festival, they've come up with an alternative plan to promote commerce and invite people to a fun-filled weekend in Stone Harbor safely together. Uh, this year, they're calling the event Saving September Weekend. So what it would consist of is Friday evening, 
they would like to hold a sip and shop event throughout the downtown shopping district. That would be between 6 and 9 p.m. The member businesses would promote a sale or a special that evening. Businesses would offer a sip of something, and it could be alcoholic or non-alcoholic on a small table outside their shop. Uh, since shoppers have to be masked to enter a store, all these sips would have to be outdoors. Um, they will have uh, unplugged musicians throughout the shopping district. They're thinking two on the 200 block of 96th Street, another one on the 300 block, uh, another two between 97th and 98th Street, and two between the corners of 95th and 3rd Avenue. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it for Friday. Saturday um, will be geared to the restaurants and they are calling it Stone Harbor on Blanc. I don't know if you remember last year, they did an on Blanc dinner on 96th Street. Um, you can't do it in that fashion, um, but men, uh, member restaurants will be encouraged to promote a, a prefix on Blanc menu. Diners can make reservations, come wearing white. They can order takeout, have dinner parties on their decks or at their homes. Um, they can, or they can make reservations to have dinner at a specific location, and this is going to be called Sunset Diner on Blanc. This option will be limited to 250 people. Their first choice for this location is the 81st Street Marina parking lot. The second choice is the Point parking lot. The Chamber will be benefit from this event in two ways. They'll sell a white bag to anyone that it, to anyone. And that includes a saving September weekend 2020 wine glass and a mass for a fixed price. And then the other is the chamber, the chamber will be charging a premium to participate in the Sunset Diner on Blanc. That's the event that would be at this specific location. It'll be from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, they'll allow setup between 4 and 5. They'll provide the hosts and the space to check in parties. They'll make sure everyone is following their rules and social distancing. Diners will not be able to mingle and gather together. Dinner parties have to remain in their designated spaces. Whatever they bring, they have to take with them when they go. They'll request from the borough trash and recycling cans to be on the premises. Um, if the approved spot is the marina lot, they will have to rent two porta potties. Um, they'll be charging per space for the Sunset Diner on Blanc. One space is approximately two parking spaces in size, 16 by 18 foot. Um, and each space accommodates up to a party of eight and no more. And they're thinking of selling 30 to 35 spaces for diners to bring. Now diners bring their own tables, chairs, decorations, and food. And it's a maximum of 250 people, socially distanced between tables. And they will encourage those people also to um, use takeout from participating restaurants. So I know that was a lot. So if you have any, any questions, uh, feel free. Jenny, we talked about the uh, sip and shop on Friday night that that could present some kind of a, an issue, couldn't it? In uh, yeah, I mean, I, I will definitely forward to the chamber the um, guidelines for from the Board of Health um, any food samples that they're providing outside on tables have to be individual. You can't have, um, you know, at this time you can't have, you know, a plate of food where people are all grabbing at the same area or, or using the same utensils. Like, you know, you can't have like a bowl of chips or something like that. Everything has to be separate. So someone would have to man that table and hand out uh, whatever it is they're giving out um, individually. Yeah. Does anybody else ha have any concerns about that portion of it? No, because I don't know how that how that's going to work. When you know when we're encouraging everybody to have masks, and now everybody's going to be out out front of each store taking masks off and having you know samples and so on. I just kind of worries me a little. <clears throat> And I, we can definitely you know, bring that to their attention. Maybe the, the food is not a good idea. I would say maybe just with the caveat that 
perhaps samples are provided individually as they have to be, but also that individuals are directed to take whatever sample and then social distance before they remove their mask and ask to not linger around where the remaining food is and other people are, you know, attempting to approach. So I think it would, I think it can be done um, if that's adhered to. I also want to mention they're not asking for any kind of street closures anywhere. Um, the only thing that would be is, is either of those parking lot locations obviously would have to be reserved and, and uh, kind of blocked up. Kenny, the way I've seen this done um, is that uh, the sponsoring organization has handed out those shields that go over your, um, your face and they actually enable you to be able to eat and drink and still uh, maintain uh, protection for those around you. And I think you can buy them uh, in quantities of 100 at relatively cost, uh, cost effectively, and it might just solve the whole problem. Or would that have I didn't know if anyone had any um, any preference over that, you know, marina lot or the point lot. I can say I don't think the point lot would be a good idea. <laughs> well, I, I think it, aren't they? You, they're going to advertise this as a sunset dinner. Yeah, it would be from six to eight. Well, I think you want to go to the marina lot. I think that is their first choice. That is their first choice. Well, that makes sense. The marina lot makes sense. And it's only from six to eight. I don't think they need it to be any longer than that. They are bringing the people that go to that lot actually bring all their own food and all their own, you know, the chairs, tables, decorations. So it's not like it's not like being in a restaurant where you have to get wait to get served or anything. You're going to bring everything. To, I think two hours is fine. Plenty of time. Mm -hmm. So, is there a plan to submit a special event application basically as soon as possible to yeah. see? What they, okay. Yes, I think they just wanted to, you know, to see if the council or public works or the police and fire had any kind of concerns over any of this that they could address it right away. Would they be driving their cars with the tables to the marina and setting them up? Because you know that's that that pull through around might get a little hairy. Yeah, they would be taking their their car. I would think they would be taking their cars there. Right. They can. They're uh, they're suggesting that they can set up between four and five, and then the event starts at six. So they could. So then, like all the all the cars would be out of there, and they walk to their tables. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the, 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 and come back. Yeah. I think the marina would be okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Did you hear me? Jen? Yeah, what was that? Sorry. I think you're muted. I'm trying to unmute me. There you go. I can no. Okay. There we go. Is there any reason why they moved off of 96th Street as the location for the dinner? Uh, they don't want to have to close the street. There they had last year, they closed the street and it would be too close, you'd be in too close quarters. That table, you can't have more than eight, um, eight people at a table, I don't believe, um, out for, um, for eating. So this would enable them to spread out. Frank, if, if I could add to what Jenny has said. Last year, what, uh, what happened is participants showed up to the event and the tables were pre-set up and the participants sat uh, together at a communal table. This year, and I really have to commend the chamber, they really pivoted uh, and, and addressed the concerns. Each person is going to bring their own table. They're gonna bring their own chairs. They're going to be spaced six feet apart, and they're most importantly, they're bringing their own food. So everyone will enjoy what is actually a traditional en blanc event, and they will enjoy it in a socially distant manner. And it's a way that uh, we all can enjoy this event 
uh, yet we're enjoying it differently and pivoting uh, according to the uh, circumstances uh, that we're all facing. I think I also wanted to mention that um, for the event, um, the same rules apply at this event for the outdoor dining. Um, if you're drinking alcohol, you have to be seated at a table. So no getting up and mingling around basically with your drinks. And then um, my concern was, you know, you're going to have 250 people. It's still going to be hard to get them to stay socially distant, that the law want to kind of group together anyway. But if they follow the same rules that we have, or we, we have them follow the same rules that we have for restaurants, they should be able to accomplish that. Sounds like it could be nice, I think. It's a good, good location, great for the sunset, like Ray said. Um, so we'll have them submit the application and see some of the smaller details and we'll bring it forward in two weeks. Yeah, they'll have a plan. So I'll have her um, submit that as soon as possible. And that's everything I have. Thank you, Jenny. That concludes our report, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, natural resources, Josie. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Um, natural resource report. I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Robert Smith, who um, is going to give us the highlights of our flood mitigation. You can't hear me. Now we, now can. we can. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I'm pushing the bar as hard as I can. Um, natural resources. Um, we're going to start with uh, Robert Smith, our bar administrator, who's going to give us the highlights of the flood mitigation committee meeting that we had on the 30th of July. Um, this is a committee that was founded out of natural resources. It's a very important committee. About 14 people attend it. And um, Jill Galger was the the person that ran it for us and did the agenda. And so now Bob Smith is just going to give us highlights of what we did on July 30th. Thank you, Councilwoman Rich. Um, I'm going to emphasize highlights. Uh, there are three or four highlights that I just want to go over. Uh, the first is something that we've been talking about probably since I've been here in February. And that is we've had a number of uh, failing bulkheads that we've identified. I think it was actually uh, Grant that identified these, these failing bulkheads. And so we've actually had to unfortunately undertake uh, enforcement action against uh, three or four of these failing bulkheads. And, and Ray, uh, in collaboration with uh, Mark Caravan, uh, has uh, ushered this through the process. And it, unfortunately, it has gotten to the point where we had to issue complaints. But the point I'm trying to make is that uh, the borough at this point in time is serious about addressing uh, those concerns. The integrity of these bulkheads are, are unsafe, uh, not only for people that actually live right in that immediate area, but they are uh, potentially a hazard with respect to flood mitigation, and we are enforcing uh, those failing bulkheads. Uh, the second reoccurring issue is the 93rd Street pump station. I cannot, and I can tell you that over the last three or four weeks, uh, we have scheduled a number of different meetings to make sure that we're on track with that project. I've had the opportunity uh, to work closely with Tom, with Jeremy, Jeremy and his staff. Uh, and I actually had uh, Wally in on one of the phone calls and I found that his input to be very helpful uh, with respect to the project. He has a vast amount of knowledge. Uh, most recently, and this is probably going to be the subject of discussion in greater detail tonight when we go into closed session, but uh, the project is going to require uh, the municipality and the county securing an easement across private property for the benefit of this project. 
Uh, so we're going to be talking to Mark about some of the legalities of that. Um, that pretty much sums it up other than uh, I have had the opportunity to try to nail down legally uh, a binding agreement between the borough and the county. Heretofore, we've had discussions uh, and we've gotten certain verbal commitments, but in, in my mind, that wasn't sufficient in terms of planning. Uh, so we did have a meeting with Bob Church, I think it was the end of last week. Uh, and we're getting to the point where we're actually able to memorialize our understanding within a memorandum of understanding or agreement. And that's gonna be invaluable in terms of uh, budgetary and project planning uh, reasons. The next issue is the Water Tower Park uh, lot, as well as the, uh, the neighbors that adjoin that parking lot. Uh, they happen to front 96th Street. Um, Martha Blasi and I had the opportunity last week, I think it was, to go out and speak with Marnie, who was initially representing the store owners. Of course, she works for the Chamber of Commerce. We own that corner building. And the problem in that area is not just the parking lot, but what the flooding is doing when the water falls off of the roof through a soffit that may or may not be working properly, what it actually does to the sidewalk, to the alley, to the front sidewalk, and actually uh, the rear of the buildings. Since uh, Mark and I actually went out and did a site visit with Marnie, uh, Martha Blasio has had the opportunity to speak with uh, the condo association uh, president and some of the owners. Even though what we're doing with the Water Tower parking lot is not uh, contingent upon their buy-in, uh, we've had the opportunity. It's the right timing. And whether or not they opt in or out, of course, we're still proceeding. And then the last issue uh, and certainly not the least, we do have, uh, Mark de Blasio and I, we have a FEMA uh, seminar set up. Uh, we are trying to identify further FEMA grant funding for future projects in the borough. Um, so I, I think that's scheduled sometime next week and we intend to be as aggressive as we can when it comes to securing grants for flood mitigations for the borough. And that's a, a real quick overview of what we've been working on over the last few weeks. Great, thank you. Any questions? Okay, then I'd like to move on. Um, I think that the next uh, uh, discussion is going to be from Aaron Baker from Lomax. We have been talking for quite a long time uh, for doing a dune vegetation management plan between 80th and 83rd Street. And I will let him present it and then there might be more questions. I know that um, the 83rd Street uh, property owners are going to go in on this with us, but I think Aaron can probably explain that better than I can. Go for it, Aaron. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, Aaron Baker with the Lomax Consulting Group. Um, so what we have is a dune vegetation management project um, in the borough's dunes between 80th and 83rd Street. Um, and just as a kind of a quick review for people that might not be as familiar with the DVMP program, um, the kind of the main goal of the program is to remove invasive vegetation from the dunes and replace it with native vegetation. Uh, this helps to naturalize the dunes, increases biodiversity, uh, it's better for the wildlife, it reduces the fire risk that these large pine trees represent. And as a side effect of that, uh, it also you know, tends to improve people's views of the ocean uh, over the dunes. Um, this project is more unique because the borough is actually a sponsor of the project. Typically these projects are sponsored by private property owners that are adjacent to the dunes uh, that want that you know, view benefit, whereas the borough gets the you know, uh, improved quality of dune benefit. Um, as part of this project though, some of the private property owners on 83rd Street, um, as Josie indicated, are willing to help uh, fund the project 
and there's actually going to be a kind of a cost sharing 50-50 uh, split between the borough and the private property owners for the project. Um, and we've been, our office has been working with the Natural Resource Committee now for about a year, you know, two, going, probably going on three years on this project. Um, and we've, you know, we're at a point now where we've got plans put together. Uh, we have a landscaper that's lined up and has given us a quote. And we have, a, you know, all the potential project sponsors on board. Um, so at this point, next step for the project is for council to review the plans um, and agree to the you know, design and the, uh, the cost sharing. Um, so I think at this point, I'm gonna try and share my screen so we can all be looking at the plans and we'll just kind of run through them. Um, if anybody has any questions at any point, you know, feel free to jump in. Um, but let's see if this works here. All right. Uh, is the plan showing up? Good. Yes. Yes, yep. it is. Um, so this is an inventory of the Japanese black pine, which is the invasive vegetation that's kind of the main target of the program. Um, as you can see, 80th Street, can you see my mouse moving too? Yeah, okay. Um, 80th Street's on the right side here. Um, there's, you know, a dozen or so black pine there um, near the, uh, the viewing spot there. Um, but then it's pretty sparse. It's all native vegetation until you get over towards 83rd Street, um, where if we go look at this inset, um, this is where the majority of the black pine are located in the project area. Um, there's a 116 black pine that we surveyed um, just in this project area. You know, 90% of that is on this corner of 83rd Street. Uh, this is a well-established stand of black pine. You know, some of these are more than 20 feet tall, closing in on 30 feet in some spots. Um, and kind of a side effect of the black pine, they grow great in the dunes. They don't have a lot of natural pests. Um, we have seen some bark beetles that have started to affect the trees, especially in Avalon. Um, but other than that, they're very hardy. They grow great and they keep growing. They're not as affected by the salt spray coming off the ocean as the native vegetation. Um, salt spray kind of, for native vegetation, it provides this sort of a natural pruning effect where the black pine, they just keep growing. Um, and that's where you kind of get into the, uh, the view shed issues. Um, but also when you get a dense stand, like we have here on the corner 83rd Street, um, you know, once we go in and remove those trees, you'll see that there's almost no vegetation there other than the black pine. They just lay down a carpet of needles, they shade everything out. So the only thing you're really left with here is black pine and poison ivy. Um, so that's where we get into the restoration part of it. So after the black pine would be removed, um, then we would go back in with native vegetation that grows well in the dunes and um, you know, make sure that we keep everything stabilized. And just a side note, when the black pine are removed, they're cut at ground level. Um, the, remote, the roots remain in place to kind of hold the sand and everything in place until the new vegetation can become established. Um, so just over here on 83rd Street, we only had a dozen or so trees. Once those come out, you know, we're not going to have a, you know, a big dead zone. So we're, we're putting in here is an assortment of shrubs and uh, herbaceous species. Uh, so uh, northern bayberry, beech plum, and groundsel. Uh, they'll be planted in five plant clusters. So, you know, just in this little area here, uh, we've got 10, 20, 30 shrubs going in there. So that'll help to fill all that in. Um, these single trees out here, uh, you know, once they come out, there's not a lot of disturbance that they leave behind uh, because the, na the native vegetation fills those in pretty well. Um, so pretty straightforward planting on this half of the project, but then we get to that corner of 83rd Street. And this is where once we once we remove those black pine, it's gonna be a, you know, almost looks like a dead zone. 
Uh, so we did a much more robust planting here with more shrubs, trees mixed in, um, some more herbaceous to fill in all the holes in between. Um, so this is the, the majority of the planting is going to happen on this corner here. Um, so in, in addition to those same shrubs we used before, we're putting in some winged sumac and eastern red cedar to kind of create that, uh, uh, you know, try and replace that tree uh, habitat that we want to see in the dunes um, you know, as a cover for birds moving through, um, fruit producing, seed producing, um, beneficial plants uh, that are really good for wildlife. Um, so in, the, in this area, there's a lot of topography. So, you know, it's a dune system. So there's peaks and valleys. Um, you know, we've kind of designed the tree species to kind of be planted in the valleys. So they have more time to establish before they, uh, you know, really get and start getting impacted by the salt spray. Uh, you know, that reduces any kind of potential view shed issues that some of the private property owners might be concerned with. And, you know, it kind of creates a more level um, vegetation landscape. Um, you'll notice also this blue line around the majority of the plantings. This is the limit of irrigation. So typically with big planting projects like this, we want to have some kind of surface irrigation, whether that's drip or spray irrigation. Um, you know, for these bigger plantings like this, spray can be more effective, but generally drip irrigation, um, you know, if you have enough line to put out there, it seems to be more effective with these types of plantings. Um, the issue we run into is that, you know, there's not a hose spigot out here that we can just connect to the irrigation to. Um, so during the review of this with the Natural Resource Committee and Public Works, um, Public Works is offered to set up a kind of uh, temporary connection out here that we could hook an irrigation system up to, put a timer on it, and you know that would run two to three times a week um, to kind of keep this area irrigated, and that helps improve survivability of all the plantings. Um, the goal is to maintain at least 85% survivorship of everything we put back in there. Um, you know, if we drop too far below that and the native vegetation is not filling in. Um, there could be the potential that we'd have to go back in and actually do some replanting. Um, you know, of the 30 or 40 of these projects I've done, we've only had to do replanting, I think, twice. Um, so it's not a common thing as long as we can get a good, you know, good irrigation in there. Those two that we had to replant, those were because the irrigation wasn't uh, working properly. Um, so this is, uh, so the removal and planting, usually we want to do that either in the spring or the fall. For this project, we're hoping to do this in kind of late fall. Typically, this would happen like October, late September, um, get everything done before November. Um, so this would be a, a fall project. And uh, the landscaper that submitted a quote for this is Haberman Landscaping. Um, to do the removal, replanting, and setting up the irrigation, they gave us a number of uh, 23,000, which was a little bit more than we were expecting when we started this project, but I think we also weren't expecting this many black pine in the dunes. Um, and, you know, with a project like this, you want to remove all the black pine, otherwise they, you know, propagate and regrow very quickly. So it's a remove all the black pine or else you're going to have to just come back in again later. Um, so just on the cost uh, side, so Haberman came in at 23,000. Our office's proposal was for 7,325. So overall cost of the project is the, comes to 30,325. And uh, like I said before, the cost would be has been kind of designed to be split between the borough and the private property owners 50-50. Uh, so the borough would be responsible for half of that and uh, for setting up the irrigation. Before I ask if there's any questions, we did put it in the budget last year or for this year, uh, $10,000 towards this project. I've also uh, been given the information that there is in the beach maintenance budget um, $5,000 so that the borough can be the 50-50 partner with this project. 
Um, are there any questions from natural resources or from any other council members or the mayor? I know that um, I think Kat Lachlan and her husband, John, are possibly out there. You cannot speak during the, during the work session, but I can guarantee you that I think we are at the point where we are going to move this forward because it is an awesome project and um, we've been wanting to do this for a long time. So, um, Lord Tedesco, do you have any comments on this? Uh, no, I think the plan, as you said, natural resources did review the plan. We've been working on these these plans for for a while. The planting plan is uh, on par with the others that we've done. Uh, it's just the only thing that makes this one any different is the involvement of the borough as as a uh, as a stakeholder in the project. Okay, then let's move it on. Um, whatever the next step is, we will. Josie. Go ahead, Ray. Are there, uh, just curiosity, are there other pockets uh, of this dense black pine on the dunes anywhere else in town? Or is this like the worst spot? This is, this is uh, the worst, yeah, the worst of it in the borough. This is uh, the rest of the dunes, you know, we've cleaned up some other spots with some of the projects we've done. Um, you know, this will be the um, third, third going on fourth project that we're doing in the borough. Um, and, you know, this, this pocket here is definitely the, uh, you know, worst like epicenter for the black pine in the borough. Yes, Aaron is very accurate. It is. And if you ride past it, I think you're going to realize that there are other things that are uh, little creatures that might be underneath some of those trees that um, this is going to be good for the borough. I, I guess the only the, the only uh, the only drawback is we're, that we're going to do this at the same time we're about to ask all the residents to conserve water usage as much as possible because you know we're on the precipice of this uh, this water problem we're using too much but um, that's just how it timed out that's all. I'm not going to say I'm going to wish for a rainy fall though. <laughs> <laughs> And that, is, that is the end of that, Aaron. If you've got um, whatever our next steps are, if we need to have a natural resource meeting or any kind of meeting, just let us know. And um, from there, I'm going to see that Dr. Tedesco has something she'd like to share about the month of August. Yeah, um, not really. The only thing I did did want to add um, that kind of picks up a little bit on on some of Aaron's comments, but I know I've been getting a lot of questions from folks about what's going on with the trees and why they're turning brown and leaves are falling off and everything else. And uh, simply put, that's salt pruning in action. Those are non-native trees that really can't take the salt and the uh, tropical storm. Uh, if you notice which trees are going are losing their leaves, um, it's really the south facing trees. We had a lot of southerly uh, wind during that tropical storm, uh, southeasterly for three hours or so, and then out of the southwest for about another hour. And that's really the uh, direction of, of attack. Um, the sycamores took a pretty big hit. The leaves are all curled and falling, and then you'll see all the other uh, trees that are have been impacted uh, with uh, their dropping leaves. Um, What's the long-term prognosis for the most part? If it's a healthy tree, it'll probably be okay. It's just the leaves got burned. It's salt burning. And uh, next year, they should be okay. On the other side of that, if they were weakened trees or trees that were already struggling for other reasons, some of them could, could succumb to, uh, to that kind of a stress. But um, I know I've been getting a lot of questions uh, about what, what really happened. And it's, it's pretty apparent when you drive down 2nd Avenue, you can see it uh, pretty pretty uh, intensely. So uh, that's my factoid for the day for people that are asking questions. But otherwise, I really have, uh, I don't have anything else. Okay, any other questions for anyone else? Um, Josie, just before we move on from the um, DBMP stuff. Um, so the next steps, I guess, just so we can get through this, uh, the Stone Harbor Natural Resource Committee um, they would give their recommendation to council to approve the plans um, and then Stone Harbor Council 
um, would have to approve the plans then. That'll let us move on to uh, preparing the memorandum of agreement between the borough and the private property owners. Are we prepared to do that tonight or should that be our next meeting? Uh, uh, Councilwoman Rich, I, I think if the governing body is in favor of it, then uh, Kim, Mark and I can finalize the agreement and then have it memorialized and voted on by council at the next meeting. That sounds fine with me. That works. Everyone else? Yes. Okay, all done. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this has been a long process. So nobody else has anything for natural resources. We just have one last item to discuss and that is the Memorial Bench Program. And the reason why we're bringing this forward is because some of you may or may not remember, I can't, I can't remember the exact timeline, maybe six to eight months ago, there was discussion in a work session to temporarily cease the program. And it was kind of done with a couple of nods of the head. We never did anything formal. So the program does exist. Um, we do get in the clerk's office. We probably have about six applications right now for people who are interested in obtaining a memorial bench. So I wanted to bring it forward to see where we're at on it, if we're going to continue with the program and if we can move these applications forward um, and just open it up for discussion. Well, I can't hear you, Frank. Oh, how about now? Now we can. Okay. Um, my thought is that we should determine the number of possible spaces that are left where these benches could be uh, placed and um, make a statement that once we get to that number, the program comes to a halt. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I quite frankly, I, I think you're right, uh, Mayor, in your assessment. I was under the assumption that we put this program to bed, but I think, I think you're right. I, um, <clears throat> I think we have enough of these benches in town as it is. I, I don't, uh, I think the, the design of these benches and the memorialization of them are, these are things that in my opinion, belong more in a cemetery or a memorial garden. They don't belong all over Stone Harbor. And where do you stop it? You know, Frank, if you're going to, we could always find more spaces to put these things, but I think enough is enough. Uh, uh, my recommendation would be to end it, which I, I thought that we already had. I was talking with um, Carrie this morning and she said that uh, there are quite a few people who have expressed the opinion that they would like to have um, one of these memorial benches for a relative who has passed. My only concern is that uh, if, if we know that there are 15 spaces left in the borough where these, these could go, then we, we say it's 15 and that's it. Then we, then we end it. Yeah, um, and, I, and I thought we had kind of done something like that. You know, I understand people there are certain people who may want to do this and that's great, but do all the rest of the residents have to look at this bench? I, I just don't, uh, I, I just don't, I, I would have been against this program in the beginning when it started years ago, I think about 2012, but I, you know, I wasn't there at the time. I just, I just don't think we need to clutter the, the borough with more of these concrete benches. Was it, I don't know if Grant is out there, but do we have is the marina full of them or are we trying to replace the ones that are there that don't match to make them all match i don't, I don't think, think grant's, grant's in attendance i don't think grant's on the call and i think i i believe from past discussions that these are new benches i don't think we're replacing benches these are additional benches Okay, because I know that we still have some of the slatted benches in places. And the only reason I agree with you, Ray, completely on this, because I do also um, sadly feel that the design of these benches do make them look like tombstones. 
Um, but if they're trying to uh, replace the slatted benches someplace with these, I'm, I've, I don't know. I just think that we are benched. Well, Kathy, oh, I I, during the, um, the beginning of the uh, COVID crisis, when everything was shut down, we would go down to the promenade and walk. And there are benches all along the promenade. And I have to say that I think it's kind of an, an interesting way for people to memorialize a loved one who uh, has passed on to um, have uh, this constant reminder of the loved one. And it's, it does provide a place for people to sit. So it's, um, I don't think it's a, an all bad thing. But I, I, I understand and I understand where you guys are coming from. And that's why I think we should determine the absolute number of places where these could go and cut it off at that number. And then it's done forever. Okay, this is my last comment on this. I, <laughs> I think the place to memorialize your loved one is in your mind and your memory, not on a cement bench. I agree with you, Ray. So I think uh, I agree to a certain extent with you, Ray. Um, I think what we have here now is somewhat of a tradition in Stone Harbor with these benches. And I think that that's really the issue. And I think you hit it on the head. You said you wouldn't have agreed with this from the get go, but the reality is it's been in existence for, in existence for quite some time. And so you have people who want to continue this. So I do agree with you with regard to the, uh, your sentiments that they don't, they shouldn't be all over town. I think they belong in specifically uh, reflective spots. Um, I think of the point where they are and I think of where the, uh, the there's uh, bay access at 114th Street. So I think in very specific locations they have a place in the borough and they and they have for quite some time. Obviously there's demand there otherwise we wouldn't be discussing this issue. Um, so I think in the right places um, I think they have a place in Stone Harbor. So I don't, I would hate to see it be an outright ban and um, you know, nothing for nothing. I think different people like to memorialize people in different ways for you, me or someone else. It might be in a cemetery, but this place may be so, so special in, in some families' hearts that this is where they want to memorialize someone. So I see your point. I think I don't agree fully. Um, so those are, those are just kind of my thoughts. I'm, I'm back again. I, I don't think, uh, you know, uh, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I don't, but I, again, I don't think we need to memorialize other people's loved ones out for the public, the public view, for the public to see day in and day out. I, I just don't get it. So if you want to go by way of compromise, like what Frank's suggesting, that let's do the six applications, process them, get the benches, and end it there. And let, you know, put it on the page, Jenny, that the program's over, if other people agree. And, and Ray, I thought that, um, um, that um, had come, Grant had come up with some suggestions as to where we could um, move some of the benches so that they would be more strategically placed. Uh, that wouldn't, I don't, I agree with your thoughts as far as um, wanting to limit, if not eliminate any more, but perhaps there is an opportunity to be able to move some of the benches around and so they would be more strategically located throughout the borough. Well, the point is full. The parking lot had a lot put down there and then they moved a couple of them because it was, um, I would say, over benched. So I don't disagree with that, but I just think that um, I still agree with Ray. You know, we're, we're what, how, how long are we? We're 44 blocks long and, and roughly four blocks wide. There's plenty of places to put benches. So just moving them around, it's, you know, I, they're still going to be out there for people to look at. And I, I just don't, I just don't think it's proper. Well, I don't disagree with a maximum number of benches throughout the, the borough and in specific locations where appropriate. And perhaps it's, perhaps it, 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 transforms into a program where, okay, we've 
fill out the benches, but then when those expire or they um, are, you know, have reached their useful life, then a spot opens up. And so perhaps there's a waiting list for a limited number of benches throughout the borough in specific locations so that the program doesn't go away completely, but exists in a finite form and fashion going forward. You know, it's people, if they, if they really want to do this, there's nothing stopping them from putting them on their own property. Jennifer? Uh, yes, I, I, you know, I really enjoy seeing the benches. Uh, I think they're beautiful. It adds character to the town. Um, I understand that there's a limited number of benches. I understand that too much of a good thing can be too much. And um, it's an interesting quandary, uh, but I think this brings about a bigger issue and that is one of naming rights. And um, I, you know, how long does the naming right last? When someone purchases a bench, how long does it last? 10 years. It's specifically stated in the resolution that it's for 10 years and then you can apply again. At the end of the 10 years, the donor can file an application for a new bench or the location will be offered for dedication by other members of the public. So it's good for 10 years. How old is the oldest bench? I don't know. I think Sue would know. Look, well, the, the resolution was passed in 2012. So well, you're coming up probably on some benches expiring. 2013, I imagine the first ones would have been there placed. And they're only permitted at the 81st Street Marina, 80th to 83rd Street Promenade, 95th and 1st Street parking lot. 100 and the parking lot at 123rd Street and 2nd Avenue. So there is a finite number and there is only, you know, a, uh, the location is they are limited. And they do seem to be limited to those areas where to, to Frank's point, it ends up being places where people actually go and walk and they frequent and they tend to sit and you know spend time whatever um especially down at the marina a lot of people are sitting down there at the marina and if i remember correctly when we did bring this resolution forward in 2012 we liked the design because there are no maintenance and they don't blow over they're solid and they're no maintenance um yeah. are there some in the bird sanctuary no the bird sanctuary, I believe that program stopped completely. There was, and part of that program kind of came into play with this program because what happened is folks bought benches in the bird sanctuary and then they became upset because they felt they weren't being maintained properly and they wanted the borough to start maintaining them. And that's when we looked at that and saw, you know, if you're having a program like this, then it's got to be something that is low maintenance and that's why folks pay sixteen hundred dollars for these benches because you know the, the product itself is is no maintenance and the bird sanctuary they were wooden ones they were getting worn people were getting very upset that that their benches looked bad so this program came about when it was looked at make sure that there's something that's really solid that doesn't require any maintenance. That's why you've got these cement benches and how they look. I like the benches. I like the program. Um, do we, like Frank was saying, is there, should there be a finite number determined now? What do we do with those that are in place? Do we want to continue it with a finite number? I mean, there is, to your point, Jen, there is the naming rights is done in 10 Mayor, years. Mayor, if I can interrupt you for a minute. Um, Carrie has uh, been working on this from the beginning and she has a, a definite number of what's left in each spot. Maybe that will help. Okay. Um, Hi, everyone. So the point is um, taken up. 
We can't have any more down there. We do have about eight spots that we could fill up at the 95th Street parking lot. Um, it's to replace the benches that are there. It's not adding more benches. Um, as far as the marina, we have probably, I would say eight to 12 more that we could put down there. And then the promenade, I believe only five more can fit down there. And that's all. And those numbers were set up originally when we set up the program, correct? That is correct. Carrie, could you just repeat what you said about 95th Street? How many are left at 95th Street or is it full? So 95th Street, there is one near the Beach Patrol, um, the tag office. There's one right now directly on the corner of 96th and 1st. And then when you pull in down 94th Street, I'm sorry, 95th, um, when you pull straight in, right on that walkway the, where the parking lot is, where the, um, the nodes are, those benches, um, we said that we could replace those benches with the memorial benches. Okay. So, so there is the a couple. That, yeah, the benches that Carrie's talking about are the ones with the cement ends and the wood. And so right. they, were, they, they were designated to be replaced by the memorial benches when all the locations were initially that is in 2012. Okay. Yes, we okay. do re replace the ones that are there with the memorial benches. Okay. So what's well, if, my, if, my math, if my math is uh, any good at all, we're looking at somewhere between 21 and 25 spaces that would be available for these benches. And my original point was to say, find out how many places there were and then cut it off and that's it, and make the announcement that it's over and done with. So you're saying don't add any more or go with the, these original locations? Go with the original locations, but it, it terminates when those are filled and they're no more available. And then are you, is, it, is it just your opinion that then they continue to expire in the 10 years, they remain there, just no new ones? Or do you say after 10 years, the bench is removed completely and not replaced? That's a whole different question, a whole different... Uh, <laughs> well, that would end the program. Well, how do you... Uh, is there any action that the borough takes to notify people that the, uh, their naming rights is coming to an end? Or do I we just... Carrie, rely? you would know that. Carrie, do you... I, so, it hasn't happened yet, correct? No, it has not happened yet because I believe the first one was 2013, but I'm not exactly sure because Craig Reeves was the one that had all the applications prior to myself, um, and he is no longer with us. But So it is coming up to the time. I do have six right now that would like to get a memorial bench. So another option is if you want to say, you know, will allow it till the end of the year for applications to come in because typically on the application they have to be in by December 31st for placement in May of the following year. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I would be comfortable with limiting it to the number of people who have already expressed an interest uh, in having one of these memorial benches. If that number is six, then you can, you can cut it off at that point and say, we're done. And then roll them over each 10 years and then you have them placed and... Well, I don't know. For if, now. If it were me, I'd just leave the bench. I mean, those, those benches will last, last a lifetime. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'd just leave them there. I wouldn't take them out. So at this point, Carrie has six applications waiting for an answer. We have designated locations still available. Whatever we do, this is, it's a, it's a resolution that, I mean, it, this is, a, it's a program that we have to formally do something with. So that being said, I mean, we can bring some kind of formal action forward 
in a couple of weeks to vote on it and maybe play with some of the ideas we're hearing here um, and, and, and formalize something. We don't touch it, but I mean, somewhere along the line, we need to do something formal. We either don't touch the resolution and don't touch the program or we rewrite the program. So um, what's your pleasure there? My suggestion, do the six and continue to talk about it in public works and continue to talk about it in council about what we would wanna do moving forward. Because right now I'm seeing it really isn't ever, it, we don't have a consensus full steam ahead either way. Right, that's true. And so I, maybe we need to start playing with the resolution and seeing perhaps there's some aspect of it that, that some folks can live with and some aspects they can or something to that effect. And you in know. the interim, if I understand it right, we have six people that have submitted applications and we have potentially, what, 21 to 25 potential locations where they could be placed. So it seems to me it would make sense at least to allow the six um, applicants um, and then to come up to a, re come up to a resolution before uh, accepting any further uh, requests. And that's where you could, through the clerk's office, you've got the six. Now from this point forward, the clerk's office could say, the program is under review and we will let you know in you know a couple of months whether it's going to continue or not. Madam Mayor, if I may, um, we do not have physical applications for those six. Um, we have six that have expressed interest in wanting us to continue with the bench dedication. Um, I have spoken to them and told them that as of right now, we have suspended it because we did that last um, August 2019 is when we decided to do a motion for that. So we do not have physical applications, just an interest. And people, are those people waiting for a response from you? Yes, they are. Okay. So we, Carrie gets back to those six and the rest of it, we continue to explore and look at the resolution and decide whether we're gonna stop the entire program or have a modified version and bring something forward in the next two to three months. How's yes. that sound? That sound yeah. all right? Yes, I agree with that also. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything else for discussion on the work session, so any motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned and we will move into the council meeting right away unless someone would like to have about a two or three minute break first. Everybody good? Okay. The meeting is now called to order. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Here. Kensimer? Present. Mr. Krafchick? Here. Mr. Moore? Here. Mr. Parzik? Here. This is Rich. Here. The meeting is now open. Adequate notice of the meeting was provided by posting a copy of the time and place on the Municipal Clerk's Bulletin Board and mailing a copy of same to the press in the Cape May County Herald on April 16th, 2020. For the record, this council meeting was held via video telephone conference in a Zoom format. Uh, will everyone please rise to salute the flag? I pledge allegiance. Clark, do we have any communications? Yes, Mayor, I have one letter to read. Um, this is from Pastor, the pastor from St. Brendan, the Navigator Parish. Dear Mayor Judy Davies Dunauer and Borough Council of Stone Harbor, where do I begin to say thank you to all involved in the history making event that took place on Saturday, August 15th, 2020. Let me start with you. Thank you all so much for approving the outdoor mass celebration for the psalmy of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary 
and the procession in the beach to the beach for the wedding of the sea. Thank you also for waiving any fees that the parish would have incurred. It was truly a blessed event and many in attendance and it was yet your yes that inaugurated the first ever event for the parish and for the municipalities of Stone Harbor and Avalon. I would also like to thank the Stone Harbor Beach Patrol for their work in preparing the path on the beach and for them taking me out in the boat to cast the wreath and bless the sea. The water was just a little bit rough, but I listened very carefully to all their expert advice and all went well. I also want to thank you for the use of the rec center and the facilities and the support of the rec center staff. I want to thank the police, the paramedics, the traffic control, and anyone I am inadvertently forgetting to mention that had part in this celebration. I'd also like to thank the parishioners, Ted Burke for his vision of the parish doing an outdoor mass, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. And also Deacon Bill Loth for thinking that the wedding of the sea would be a great first outdoor celebration and for spearheading the new wedding of the sea undertaking. Deacon Bill has been organizing the parish wedding of the sea celebration for about 20 years now. With this first ever outdoor celebration, many details had to be attended to and Bill organized it with the help of all of you as well as the parish committee. It was beautiful to see that folks from both main churches of our parish, St. Paul's and St. Maristella, worked so hard with Weon Eucharistic community to make this history making event one that will live on in the minds and hearts and souls of so many. I also want to thank all those that attended in person and via live stream. Thank you, Ted Burke, for live streaming. All I heard at the rec center, at the beach, and via social media was how blessed people felt, how their strength was, faith was strengthened, and how they hope to do it again. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. It was certainly one of the highlights of my priesthood. I am so delighted to be the new pastor at St. Brendan the Navigator, and I'm also thrilled to see how teamwork makes <coughs> our dream work. Very nice very well attended event. Um, any other communications? No, that's all, Mayor. I need a motion accepting the communication as read into the record. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? May I have a motion concerning the minutes? Madam Mayor, since all members of council have been provided with a copy of the minutes of the regular meeting of July 21st and the work session and regular meeting of August 4th, 2020, if there are no additions or corrections, I move we dispense of the reading of the minutes and that they be approved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We'll now have public comment. Anyone wishing to address mayor and council may do so at this time by raising your hand electronically. If you're on the meeting via video, click on the appropriate location. If you are participating via telephone, please hit star nine. When called upon, you will state your name and address for the record. Please make sure to mute your device after your question is answered and to mute your device, you will need to hit star six. So is there anyone who would like to address mayor and council? Pat Lachlan. Go ahead, Kat. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council. I wanted to be addressed. Do you need me to state my address into the record? Yes, please. Sure. Catherine M. Lachlan, 1983rd Street, Stone Harbor, New Jersey. I just wanted to weigh in and thank everybody. I know this has been a two-year process on the project and everybody who has been involved with it. I can't thank you enough for everything that everyone has done. And I look forward to continuing to work with the borough administrator and the Natural Resources Council to finalize the memorandum of agreement and put this final piece in place so we can get this done this fall. Okay, good. Thank you, Kat. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. We are too excited. Thank you, Kat. Is there anyone else who would like to address Mayor and Council? See anybody, Jennifer? 
No, I do not, Madam Mayor. Okay. Seeing no one, I'll close public comment. Ordinance 1570. Uh, can't hear you, Frank. Sorry. 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 Can you hear me now? Yes. I offer um, ordinance 1570, which is to provide uh, payment for the use of off-duty police officers to serve as traffic advisors. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Will the clerk read the title only of ordinance 1570 on second reading? An ordinance of Verston Harbor County of Cape May, New Jersey, establishing a new chapter authorizing and governing the use of services of off-duty law enforcement officers employed by the Stone Harbor Police Department as traffic police traffic directors. The public, the public hearing on ordinance 1570 is open. public hearing is closed. Mayor, I offer, um, I make a motion that 1570 be passed on second reading and advanced to the third and final reading. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Ms. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kraftcheck? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Will the clerk read the title only of Ordinance 1570 on third and final reading? Authorizing and governing the use of services of off-duty law enforcement officers employed by the Borough of Stone Harbor as police traffic directors. Mayor, I offer, and Mayor and Council, I make a motion that Ordinance 1570 be passed on third and final reading, adopted and published according to law. Second. Clark, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mr. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchek? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Ordinance 1571. I make a motion that Ordinance 1571 be taken up for second reading. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Will the clerk read the title only of Ordinance 1571 on second reading? Concerning the use of beach umbrellas on the Stone Harbor beaches. The public hearing on Ordinance 1571 is open. The public hearing is closed. I make a motion that Ordinance 1571 be passed on second reading and advanced to third and final reading. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Grefcheck? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Will the clerk read the title only of Ordinance 1571 on third and final reading? Concerning the use of beach umbrellas on Stone Harbor beaches. That Ordinance 1571 be passed on third and final reading adopted and published according to law. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Krafchek? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. So we have a couple of resolutions now for appointing new police officers. Uh, so we're gonna move forward with the resolutions. We're normally at that time, we would then go ahead and swear in the police officers. Um, for obvious reasons, we have to change how we do that. So what we're gonna do is offer both resolutions and when council convenes for closed session, we're gonna swear in the police officers with their families one group at a time. 
and we'll be able to do that swearing in in person and the entire governing body will be able to be a part of that ceremony. Um, so with that, resolution 2020-S-166. Mayor and Council, I offer resolution 2020-S-166, which calls for the appointment of um, Daniel Gomez as a new police officer for the borough. Second. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Ms. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Krafchick? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020-S-167. Mayor and Council, I offer resolution 2020-S-167, which calls for the appointment of Tyler W. Landells as a new police officer for the borough. Second. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Ms. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Krafchick? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020 S-168. Mayor and Council, I offer resolution 2020-S-168 for adoption. Second. This provides for the purchase uh, through the source well cooperative of a new trash truck for the borough as was well budgeted for this year. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mr. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Krafchick? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020-S-169. Madam Mayor, I offer Resolution 2020-S-169 for adoption. Second. This resolution authorizes the borough to refund to D. Palatino contractors a surety in the amount of $2,360 related to work performed at a street opening at 9101 First Avenue. The work uh, was complete and compliant and therefore the surety may be returned to the contractor. And discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Ms. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchuk? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020 S-170. Madam Mayor and Council, I offer resolution 2020-S-170 for adoption. Second. This resolution is to refund dis disconnect fees that were not uh, required uh, to DL Minor Construction Company in the amount of $525. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Ms. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Krafchick? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020-S-171. Madam Mayor and Council, I'm pleased to present Resolution 2020-S-171. It extends both boot camp and the farmer's market to the end of September. Second. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Krafchick? Yes. Mr. Moore? Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. I need a motion authorizing the administrator to work with the solicitor on the shared services agreement in reference to the municipal court. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We have no items of discussion. Um, I just have a couple of real quick things, items of interest for both uh, council members and for the public. Um, as JT Lacoste touched on um, the August 17th health department report that Cape May County has below 100 active cases, including out of county cases that have not completed the quarantine period. Remember that our population grows so much in the summer. So this is pretty significantly low number and is good news for us. 
I also wanted to take the opportunity tonight to fill everybody in on what's going on with the school. I get a lot of questions about what's going on with the school and our enrollment. Um, I attended the last Stone Harbor School Board meeting via Facebook Live last Wednesday and learned that between our two schools, we've received an additional 23 students. Now, none of these are tuition students. They're all residents of the Seven Mile Island. Um, four of those new students are enrolled in the Avalon School. I'm not sure what grades. The additional 19 are all enrolled in our Stone Harbor School. The breakdown by class in Stone Harbor is four additional students in the kindergarten, six additional students in the first grade, four additional students in the second grade, four additional students in the third grade, and one additional student in the fourth grade. And our school does resume session September 8th. The first week, there'll be half days for students. The following week will begin their full days and they will be doing a hybrid program. Group A will go to school Monday and Tuesday, all remote learning on Wednesday, and Group B will go to school in person on Thursday and Friday. Um, so they got a lot of hurdles ahead of them at the school and we wish them the best of luck as they, as they charter this the unchartered territory. Um, any questions on the school? And one other thing, just so the public is aware, the Borough Hall did return to normal business hours last week on Monday, August 10th. Employees have all returned to work and the building is open to the public during regular business hours, Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. and the public does have access to the building. That being said, we do continually strongly encourage appointments to conduct business. Call or email in advance with the appropriate office and make your appointment. Please continue to drop, continue to use the drop box located on the 95th Street entrance for routine payments and or paperwork. Do not enter the building, please, if you feel ill. And just a reminder, face coverings are required when you do enter Borough Hall and once inside, always maintain social distancing. And that is all that I have for you tonight. I have a motion approving the bill list. Madam Mayor, I move that we approve the bill list and authorize the CFO to pay the bills when the funds are available and the vouchers are properly endorsed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? At this time, we're about to consider a resolution to go into private session. We would appreciate it if you would all remain seated or all remain on Zoom until the resolution has been acted upon. At the conclusion of the private session, we'll come back into public session for the purpose of either taking action as a result of our discussion in private session or to simply adjourn. It is also possible that someone might bring up some other item of business in public session after we come back from private session. Resolution 2020-S-172. Mayor and Council, I offer resolution 2020-S-172 for the uh, borough council to go into closed session. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Dallahan. Aye. Mrs. Densima. Mr. Kravchuk. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Parzik. Yes. Mrs. Rich. Yes. Okay, so we'll see everybody at Borough Hall for the swearing in of the officers and for the um, Closed session, and then we will return to Zoom to the public after we've conducted that bit of business. Okay.
Who? A girl? <laughs> no. Hey, Sue. Yes. I'm going to call the roll when I see that everybody's here just to make sure that okay. everybody's back. Okay. So I'll, I'll monitoring it, but I'll just ask you to do a roll call as soon as it looks like everybody's back. Can you hear me?
I see everybody but Reese. Oh, there's Reese. I think I have everybody. I need a motion to return to open session. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll just so the record reflects that everybody has returned. So clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Dalhan? Here. Mrs. Gensimer? Here. Mr. Krafchick? Here. Mr. Moore? Here. Mr. Parzik? Here. Mrs. Rich? Here. Okay. I need a motion for the administrator and the solicitor to proceed as discussed in closed session in reference to the Villa Maria and two easements associated with the 93rd Street pumping station. So moved. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yeah. Mr. Kravchuk? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. We'll now have um, second session of public comment. Anyone wishing to address Mayor and Council may do so at this time by raising your hand electronically. If you're on the meeting via video, click on the appropriate location. If you're participating via telephone, please hit star nine. When called upon, please state your name and address for the record. I'm not seeing anyone. I will close public comment. Motion to adjourn. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Have a good night. Stay well. Good night, all. Good night, everyone. You too.